All right, the title of my sermon this morning is What a Church Should Be. What a Church Should Be. So some things in this passage, and I'll come back to it in a moment, where we can see the sort of thing a church should strive to be. And I'm going to cover four things this morning. But before I get into the four things a church should be from 1 Timothy 3, I want to talk a bit about what church is. For those of you, you know, who haven't heard me sort of preach on these sort of topics before, what is a church? Because people use that word differently in different ways. So we want to be very clear that a church means a congregation. A church means a congregation. Look at Hebrews 2.12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now Hebrews... This Hebrews 2 passage, verse 12, is a quote from Psalm 22, verse 22. And look at what it says. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So the Bible is very clear that the word church means a congregation. So we see when it's quoted, it's used there interchangeably. Now it's used to refer both to the General Assembly, so the General Assembly, like here right now, we're all assembled here and we're all at attention. The church is referred to this as this assembly here, but it also refers to the people that are part of this assembly, right? So in 1 Corinthians 14, we see, we'll just read two passages from 1 Corinthians 14. In that same chapter, how the word church is used in those two ways. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says, Yet in the church... I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue, right? So being in this church, in this congregation here. But in verse 23, look at what it says here. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and they come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad. So you see, you can assemble the church, and then when we're here, we are in church. So we are in church, but we also are a church. And you're a member of the church because you are in this church. You know, I guess you're a regular member, or you know, to the point where people consider themselves part of this congregation here. So a church is not a building. Right? So when you're driving past and you say, look at that beautiful church, you're actually using the word the wrong way. That's not a church. That's a church's building. Right? That's a building that they, you know, you know, people call it a temple or a synagogue. You, know, you have these different types of religious building. A church is not a, re- a Christian religious building. Right? A church is the people that meet in this building. And that's why, you know, a church can be anywhere. It can be in a community center, it can be in a park, it can be in a building that looks like your traditional church building. But a church is not a building. Right? A church is not a ritual either. Right? We, it's, we are the church. Right? So a church is not a ritual. And sometimes when you talk to Orthodox or Catholic people and you invite them to church or you say, hey, this is what church, you need to understand that. Because sometimes when they say, oh, you know, do you go to church? They're thinking, well, I don't want to go there and go through the rituals and repeat the thing. And in the Catholic church, they have to walk, you know, being all holy, take the communion, they walk back. So I don't know if you ever, I mean, I've never been to a Catholic church here, but in the Catholic churches in Mexico, it's all like for show, right? All the ladies are there, they're trying to look holy, holy, and then they'll walk, they even like walk like that. You know, so they're not just like standing there, they'll walk up to, to communion, right? And they're walking like this up the aisle, and then they take the communion, and then and they walk back. And it's something that Elizabeth and I always joked about, because it was just like very odd that they, would, that they would do that. And I guess they're trying to be, I don't know, they think Mary is like that. So it's not a building. It's not a ritual, right? Like what we're going through here, yeah, we have an order of the way we do things, but it's not a ritual, right? It's not just things you do. Like a ritual is something you do just to feel holy, right? It's also not the legal entity, right? So people say like, oh, you know, this church is like this corporate body that's for legal. No, no, no. Yes, a church may have legal setup to deal with the government and deal with contracts and all that sort of stuff to operate in this world, but that's not the church. The church are the people here, right? Because you can have the legal entity, but if there's no congregation, there's no church, right? So it's not a building, it's not a ritual, it's not a legal entity. So it is the congregation. So make sure, you know, make sure when your children, especially, 
when they misuse that word, correct them on it. You know, when they say, oh, we're going, you know, we're driving past the church. You know, sometimes we'll go past here, you know, when we're driving home. Oh, we're driving past the church. No, we're not driving past the church. We're driving past the community center, right? Because the church isn't there when we were driving past, okay? So in 1 Timothy 3, this is what I'm talking about today. What a church should be. 1 Timothy 3. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, so he's saying if I wait a long time, if I take a long time, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. So we can see here, number one, the way you ought to behave in the house of God. So the one thing a church should be is a godly place. How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So you see, the second thing is it's a house of God. It's meant to be a family, which is the church of the living God. And we talked about the congregation, right? The pillar and ground of the truth. So we see two more things there. A pillar, something that holds something up, and then there's the ground of truth. So we're going to go into these in a bit more depth, and I'll cover some passages uh, which talk about these things. So it's one, it's a godly place. Two, the house of God. Three, it's a pillar of truth. And number four, it is a ground of truth. So let's go into those four things a little bit more in depth so you can see, hey, what we should be striving for as a church to make this place be, make this congregation be. So number one, it's a godly place. Now before we got to verse 14 and 15, right? He says, how thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. He's referring to these things when he referred to the qualifications of leadership in the Bible, in, in the church. This is a true saying of a man desire the office of a bishop. He desireth a good work. And he goes through all these different things. Now this sermon is not about the qualifications of the bishop, so I won't spend too much time here. But we can see here that leaders are men because they are husbands of one wife. They're not wives of one husband. And this is why church leadership should only be men. Right? They should be deacons and bishops should only be men. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, obviously not a drunkard, you know, they behave well. Given to hospitality, right? So they're hospitable towards each other people. Apt to teach, they have ability to be able to explain complex concepts in a more simpler way for new people. Uh, not given to wine, no striker, right? So not just getting into brawls and fights on the street, all that sort of stuff. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. Patient, not a brawler, not covetous. He's got his family in order. One that ruleth well his own house. Right? So your family is just as important. Sometimes people think, you know, I often have spoken to people in the past and they're saying like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm you know, uh, the one that has to meet the qualifications. Not my family, not my wife. Wrong. Right? So your family, your wife and your family is included to see whether or not somebody qualifies for this position. For a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So you can see that your family and your wife is like the testing ground to see whether or not you can lead something even bigger. Not a novice, right? So he's not just new to Christianity. Less being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And this is something I've seen in my, my own life, right? But I see in other people as well. You know, you see in young Christians, they get a little bit of knowledge and they think, you know, they think they know everything. It's like with kids, you know, they watch a few YouTube videos, they think they know everything, they think they know more than their parents. Young Christians are the same. They listen to a few sermons online, they get some good knowledge, they think, oh, now they think they know everything, right? But then what happens is they just get puffed up, they just become pri prideful, right? They start looking down on everybody else. And this is why I said to you a couple of weeks ago, and even last week, you know, the more you grow spiritually, you start to get a bit more compassion on other people, because you don't only realise, you know, you don't know everything, but also you realize your own failings as well. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So to me, that is talking about you know, people that, you know, he, he's, he's not just rubbing shoulders with people that have you know, all material possessions, but also people that are poorer as well. So he keeps himself humble. He can relate to both people that have money and people that don't. The deacons are the same, right? But you see here, even so must their wives, right? So you see your wife can disqualify you, you know, from being ordained into a position of leadership. Not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, 
ruling their children in their own houses as well. So you can say the deacon as well is a man, not a woman. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now oftentimes, and the point I want to make here is, oftentimes people read these qualifications and they get the impression, they go, yeah, well, I'm not a bishop. I'm not a deacon. So I don't need to strive for this. And what you're misunderstanding, or what you may not understand here, is these are not requirements just for bishops and deacons. These are requirements for everybody. This is how we all ought to behave ourselves in the house of God. But if you want to be, if you desire the office of a bishop or the deacon, then you must have these qualifications. Right? So it's not that just because you don't want to be a bishop or you say, oh, I'm a lady, I'm not going to be a bishop or a deacon one day. We are meant to all strive for this. This is just godly Christian living. So you don't just get a pass just because you're not in a position of leadership. Because you think, oh, well, I'm not going to be a bishop or a deacon one day, then I can kind of let the rules slack a bit. No, everybody is meant to be striving for this, you know, the, this level, right? And obviously, you know, we, we try our best to keep all these, right? This is not a standard of, like, a checkbox, Right? But these are principles, characteristics that you ought to strive for. So when we're thinking about church, you see how he's saying, hey, this is godly living. This is righteous living. And he's saying, hey, this is how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Obviously, he's telling this to the leader to lead that example and be that example because it's also expected of the congregation. And this is why. You know, first, my first point, we want church to be a godly place. And if we understand, hey, we are the church. It's not just about the church, just this, this entity, this, this corporate you know, that exists on paper, just having like policies and saying, hey, look, this is what we should be. Because if you, as individuals, don't actually live to this standard, it's going to be nothing. What does it matter if you say, oh yeah, the Bible says how we're meant to live. Hey, we have it written down in these policies and on this constitution and whatnot, but then you just throw them out the window and think, well, I'm not a bishop or, you know, doesn't, yeah, nobody's going to think about it. So take this to heart, guys. You are the church. You know, we want, if we want this church to be a godly place, then you need to be godly people. Right? You need to strive to be godly. We want our church moving in that direction and you need to move in that direction. The church is not just going to automatically you know, be right, a righteous and godly place just because it's written in the Bible, just because it's written down on some piece of paper. If you don't do it, if we don't do it, then this place is not going to change. Right? So we are the church. Remember, whatever we do, the church will be whatever we are, because we are the church. So not only do we want it to be a righteous place, which is things that are positive that we should strive for, we see in 1 Corinthians 5, things that are not welcome at church. Right? There are certain sins in the Bible where somebody gets a reputation of doing these things and it's out there. They're unrepentant. It's not welcome here. I remember once, you know, I was speaking to a reporter, you remember at the marriage march, I was, I was speaking to a reporter and he said to me, isn't, isn't everyone meant to be welcome at church? And I'm like, no. I don't know where you got that idea from, that everybody is welcome at church. There are certain sins that will make you not welcome at church. Why? Because church, what should a church be? It's meant to be a godly place. And just like society, if you just let criminals, there's no punishment, just let it run rampant. There are certain crimes in the Bible that get you removed from society. Hey, there are certain sins that ought to get you removed from church too. Why? What's the purpose of it? It's because we don't want them to get right with God and repent of it and come in. No, it's because we need to keep this place a godly place. 1 Corinthians 5. I'll just read through it quickly and I'll show you some things in here. It is reported commonly that, is, that there is fornication among you. What's fornication? It's when you sleep with somebody you're not married to, right? Or sleep with something you're not married to, right? Because it includes bestiality as well. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. See, so it's not when just somebody makes one mistake, but it's like it's reported commonly. This guy's reputation, everyone knows what's going on, you know, and it's, it's not being dealt with. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned 
that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Isn't that like the opposite of what people think? See, them keeping him around is them doing the wrong thing and being puffed up. But oftentimes people think, oh, yeah, we keep, we're so loving. You know, that's why we just allow all this sin in our church. You know, you're not condemning anybody for committing certain, these certain sins. And you know, it's because we're just so loving. You see how they puff themselves up by keeping them around. And then that's what Paul is saying here. You actually puffed up rather than actually mourn and humbled in the church to, to get this out of the church. That he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit, the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, so that doesn't, this doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved. Right, just because you, somebody is, is unrepentant of a sin that they're committing that gets them kicked out of church, doesn't mean they're not saved. Right? So they can get kicked out, you know, they're doing something that may be worthy of the government dealing with it, then you know, when you get kicked out of church, that's what the Bible calls delivering such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So even if that person is not saved, hopefully that act will humble themselves enough to be saved as well. So like I said, sin doesn't necessarily mean you're not saved. Right? Because we're saved just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. No, ye not. That a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So this whole idea is like, oh, everyone's welcome, which is so loving. No, no. He says your glorying's not good. Why? Because if you leave certain sins in the church, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Right? So we're not an island. You know, when we sin, we affect other people. Right? You affect your family. You affect your church. You know, this is why I always you know, stress, you know, how we talk, how we dress, you know, this is important as well, you're not an island, so sometimes when girls think, oh, you know, I just wear this, it's comfortable, yeah, well, you got to understand, you're not an island, you know, you come here, you know, you don't want the guys struggling to focus on God because they have to stare at your buttocks all day, you know what I mean, so this is why it's important how you dress, ladies, because we need to think about how we make this place a godly place to facilitate and encourage people to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than you know being distracted by things they ought not to be distracted with. So not not uh, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So we our sin can have an influence throughout the church. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. So what is he saying here? He's saying, hey, you shouldn't company with fornicators, but he's saying that doesn't mean you can't company with fornicators like everywhere in the world. Like, you know, obviously you're going to work with them and whatnot. He says, or idolaters, or then must ye needs go out of the world. He says, you don't have to leave this world to completely get away from it, right? But he says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So you see how it's not just like any sin gets people kicked out. There are certain sins that if they're serious enough, and you know, the person's not repentant, you know, we see here that obviously in 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, we see that this person did actually repent and he was welcomed back in. So fornication is one of them, right? That's sex outside of marriage, right? So that includes adultery, bestiality, homosexuality, and obviously just standard fornication, right? Two people that, two singles that aren't married. Covetous, right? So somebody who's covetous. Now obviously everybody to some extent likes new things and things like that. But what, what do I think of, think of covetous? Like somebody who's like worshipping money and is given to money. It's all they're about. You know, when I think of somebody who's covetous, think about like, you know those, you know sometimes like on, on YouTube you get those ads where they're trying to sell you like dropship thing and everything. It's some, some business model they're trying to sell you, right? Or some course they're trying to sell you. And first thing, like, you know, they're, they're in the video and behind them is like this Lamborghini or they're like on their yacht and they're like, oh, you want to live this lifestyle? I can work wherever I want. It's just like this, this idea of like just glorifying, just like 
this uh, hedonistic lifestyle, and you say, oh, you can have all the money, you can have all this, that's covetous, right? Where it's just like every people just worship, that's all they're about, that's all they just want, money, money, money. And sometimes these, these, these young men or people that are like pushing all these different business models on YouTube, that's how they try and hook people. Oh, you want to make this much money? Oh, I just love making money, do this money, 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 money. Covetous. Idolater, obviously that's somebody that's you know, got idols and statues and all that sort of stuff, bowing down to them and whatnot. It's unacceptable, right? And I would include, like, this is why people have like, these lucky charms as well. It's idolatry as well. You know, if you like wear a necklace just because it looks nice, yeah, fair enough. But if you have this thought in your mind, like, oh, I wear this necklace because it, you know, it keeps me from harm. You know, it's, not, you know, it's, it's lucky when I wear this. That's idolatry. You know, you're attributing some sort of protection to some object rather than to God. A railer. It's a false accuser. Right? And people say things about other people that are not true. Drunkard, obviously, people that drink too much. Extortioner, right? So this is like blackmail, right? When you're doing uh, evil things to people and threatening them with stuff. With such an one, no, not to eat. So you see how there are certain sins in the Bible. And I don't get this idea, it's just, you know, because all of us are sinners. Right? But that doesn't mean every sin is welcome at church. There are some that the Bible specifically outlines. It's like you cut this out because this leaven will leaven the whole lump. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? For them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Right? So we see here we want church to be a godly place. Not only we ought to strive to be godly, but there are also, we see in the Bible, certain things that need to be cut out of church in order to keep this place God. That's the first thing a church should be, a godly place. Second one is it's the house of God. And I know I touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but I like to just uh, reinforce it again and again. Sometimes you think, well, Victor, you know, you keep repeating yourself. Hey, repetition is the key to learning. <laughs> so it's the house of God. We're going to strive to be a family here. It's very important that we strive to treat ourselves, treat the people here, like our family. Mark 3. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. So here is Jesus' family coming, interrupting him, right, trying to get his attention. His mother, his brethren, as well. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. So believers are our spiritual family. And we see here how Jesus thought of his spiritual family, almost prioritizing them above his own physical family. Now, hopefully your physical family is also your spiritual family. I mean, that's ideal. But oftentimes, sometimes, your physical family is not your spiritual family, right? And the Bible is saying here, we ought to love our spiritual family even more so than our physical family. Does that mean you don't love them? No, of course not. But it's a prioritization here. And we see even here, Jesus his physical family, his mother, you know, the one that the most Catholics and Orthodox think that, hey, this intercessor is coming to try and, you know, get his attention. And he says, who is my mother or my brethren? He stretched out his hands to his disciples. You know, he looked around about on them, which sat about him and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. So God commands us, you know, to treat, well, to think of our church as our family, because we are spiritually connected. And you know, the spirit is, you know, they say blood is thicker than water. You know, the spirit, you know, overcomes blood. First Timothy 5. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So notice how you treat those that are older than you like you would a parent. The younger men as brethren. So you see how the your people your age, they're like your siblings. The elder women as mothers. The younger as sisters with all purity, right? So we have God commanding us here to treat each other like we would treat our family. Galatians 6. See, if it's a family, here we can help one another. Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, 
considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So you see here, this is the sort of attitude you should have when you try and help people. You know, you, you try and help them. You know, if you're trying to help somebody, obviously you would be the more spiritual one, right? trying to help somebody. But you restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Right? What does meekness mean? Right? It's, it's humility, isn't it? It's knowing your own weaknesses as well. Right? So when you approach somebody, you go there with some empathy. So some people, you know, especially new believers, you know, they want to correct everyone. They're coming from a place of condescension, right? Where they're just like, they're better than everyone, and that's why they're going to go around telling everyone the right way to do things. As opposed to going there in love and in the spirit of weakness, meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, so we're together. We're a family. We can help one another, bear each other's burdens. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. I'll just, sorry, I'll just touch on verse 5. So this is saying, obviously everyone's responsible for their own burden. Right? That's what verse 5 is saying. But this is saying, verse 2 is saying, help one another with each other's burdens. It's not that, it's not that your, somebody else's burden is your responsibility, which is what verse 5 is about. Verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So notice here, you see how we try and do good to all men. So it's not like you don't do good to people that aren't your spiritual family. You do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So you can see they're treating your spiritual family should be above your physical family as well as your friends and colleagues and whatnot. Now in this area, you know, when you're together as a church and you, the more time you spend to one another, the more connected you are here, the more you can have others help bear your burden. So sometimes when I think of these passages before, when it talks about reaping and sowing, and then it says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Yeah, that not only applies to spiritual reaping, you know, the more souls you win and the more work you do for God, eventually you're going to reap a reward. But sometimes I think about this in terms of this. You know, sometimes when people, you know, they're down and out of luck. You know, sometimes I have people email me from other countries or whatnot and say, asking for help. And then I say, like, well, what church are you? Why isn't your church helping you? But then it's like, they'll say, well, it's because they weren't really involved in their church. So you see, like, sometimes when you're down and out of luck, how much you sow, reap, is how much you're going to sow. Like, if you really don't spend much time with the people here, you know, you come and then you go, and you come and you go, you don't talk to anyone, never invite anyone over, never go to any of the events, and then you need help. And then you say, why doesn't anyone know about this? Why isn't anyone helping me? Why isn't that... You know, nobody knows about your struggles. Sometimes it's because you reap what you sow. You know, you never took the time to get to know anyone. Anyone know you? Things like that. So no, usually in a church, sometimes when people are in trouble and they get a lot of help, it's usually the people that know a lot of people in the church as well for people to, to know what their situation is and whatnot. It's not so much of an issue in our church because we, we're a small group here, so it's a lot harder to hide in a smaller group, right? But in a large group, some people can... Like in a, in a really large church with hundreds of people, some families can go, sit, and listen, go, go and sit and listen, and nobody has any idea who they are. Right? And then they're in trouble. Who do they go to? Well, but if they'd spent some time doing good to all men, that can help them. Now, is that to say that it's right that if you don't... Obviously, if somebody was in this church and they didn't know that many people and they reached out, you know, I'm sure many of us, you know, um, hopefully will we'll help. You know, we'll have the heart to say, look... It doesn't matter if I don't know this person. They're a brother in Christ. But still, we can't help them. And, and I look at it as, hey, here's an opportunity for us to really, you know, connect with them and help them out. But like I said, you know, it's, this, this, op, this, uh, this uh, principle obviously applies. First John 4, I want to show you this passage. 
Remember, we're talking about the church ought to be a house of God. It ought to be a family. You know, where you're together, right? That's why it's church is a congregation. Look, it says here in 1 John 4, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. This is what I want you to reflect on. You say, you ask yourself, do you love God? You say, oh, I love God. And then you ask yourself the question, would you love the people in this church? Do you want to be with the people in this church? Do you want to love them? Do you want to, you want to see them? Do you want to talk to them? The Bible is saying here, man, you know, your, your relationship with your brother in Christ is a reflection of your relationship with God. He's saying here, if somebody hates his brother who he's seen, it's not possible for him to love God. So some people, they say, oh, I love God, I love God so much, and they just despise being with the people in church. I'm sorry, if that's what you think, you don't love God. Because right? the Bible says here, for he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? So you see, so if you don't love your brothers in Christ, that you see, when you say, I love God, you don't really. Right? Because how can you love God when you don't even love his body? This is the body of Christ. Right? So one way we show how we love God is that we love our, the family of God. Right? So we love God, we want to be with his body. Right? It's like saying, I love my wife, but I can't stand being with her. Does it make sense? Right? Obviously, if you love your wife, you enjoy being with her. You enjoy her company. Right? Some people say, yeah, but you know what? I'm, not just, I'm just not a very outgoing person. You know, not the social thing. Well, you got, that's where you've got to grow. You know, if you're not a very outgoing, social person, friendly person, you're commanded to, to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's like saying, like, I don't do the reading. I don't do the praying. You know, I don't do the church. It's like, you know, I don't do the, I don't do the evangelism thing. You know, it's for other people. Too bad, guys. Like, these are, these are commandments. You know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not your choice whether to do it or not. You're told to do it. And now your responsibility is to strive to grow in that area. It's the same here. You know, I don't like hanging around with people. Well, you've got to start growing. You've got to start like hanging around with people. Right? You've got to start loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, number three. So, godly place. It's a house of God. Now we're going to talk about it's a pillar of of truth. A pillar of truth. So what is a church meant to be? It's a pillar. You think about what a pillar is. A pillar holds up something, doesn't it? And we put the can like the candle up, the light up, we're holding up the truth. So in a church is where you come to hear the truth and the church should be holding up the truth. The pillar of truth. 2 Timothy 4, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant. In season, out of season. So you see, whether it's popular or not, right? It's consistency, preaching the word, teaching the truth. Whether the world likes it, we preach it. If they don't like it, sometimes that makes us want to preach it even more, Right? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all unsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn, their, turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry." Right, So consistency at church. We want to be a church that holds up the truth. You know, We want to stand on things. We want to stand on the King James Bible. We want to stand on salvation by grace, eternal security. These are things that you know, a church should uphold, right? And we're trying to take a stand for. You know, baptism by immersion. You know, not sprinkling. These are the sort of things that are important, that a church ought to uphold. You know, like I talked about today in 1 Timothy 3, church leaders... Being men, not women, right? People in church, like preachers, ought not to be scared to take these stands and to teach these things from the Word of God. We think about more practical things like 
politically, and that abortion is murder. And we don't say, oh yeah, all the time, and sometimes... Yeah, are there some complex situations? Yeah, there are, but abortion is still murder if you're killing an innocent baby in the womb. There's no justification for murder, right? Like a medical procedure to save the mom where the baby may lose its life. That's not murder. You're not trying to kill the baby. You're trying to save the mom. So we need to be able to take that stand. No, abortion is murder. You can't just justify killing a baby in the womb. Marriage is one man and one woman. I mean, how many churches today are too scared to say that homosexuality is a sin? Homosexuality is wrong, right? We do not accept homosexuality. It's condemned in the Bible as a sin. And you know what? Another one. Scamdemic or not with this whole COVID thing, no government has the right to tell churches that they cannot gather. You know what I found out today? I don't know if it's a law or not, but supposedly like you're not even allowed to sing in churches these days. Have you guys heard that one in New South Wales? They're trying to tell, they're trying to tell like churches that they can't sing in church and if you have like a solo, like the person singing the solo has to be five meters away, the first person. Hey, what the government think they have authority to just tell Christians like, they can't meet, they can't sing in church? Hey, maybe that'll make you sing this last song, you know, the last song, a little bit louder. <laughs> Knowing that the New South Wales government doesn't want you to be able to sing in church. So this is where the church has to be somewhere where, hey, we are holding up the truth. We're taking a stand for the truth. Look at John 17, 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. See, so we don't desire to be removed from the world. We are in the world, like, the, like we think about, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So we're in the world, but we try and live a righteous life. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see... You should be able to come to church as a zealous Bible believer and feel normal here. That's what we sort of want in at church here, that it's normal to come here. You know, maybe when you're in the world, you know, you're talking about the Bible, you're talking about all this weird stuff the government's doing, this complete overreaction, and everyone looks at you crazy, you come to church, the pillar of truth, you feel normal. Hey, this is where this is, people are awake, people know what's going on. It's not just like, you know, nobody knows the truth here. This is sort of what we want at church. We want people, we want it to be an environment where you feel normal to be somebody that's awake, knows the truth, knows what's going on. And that's the sort of people as well, the people that are righteous, right? People that are living the right sort of life. These are the sort of people we want to uphold. So when we think about upholding truth, right? We want to honor people that are following the truth as well. We don't want to be the sort of church where it's just, Oh, you know, Prime Minister came in, Scott Morrison came in, Prime Minister, hey, why don't you say a few words, Prime Minister, or like, oh, some, you know, rugby star or whatever comes in, you know, we don't know what they believe, but hey, come up, you know, address the congregation, let's say a few words. We don't care about these worldly, you know, aspirations, these worldly um, things that they've accomplished. We want to know, now, if there's somebody who's accomplished their own life and they're also godly, great, right? But it's their godliness that lifts them up. It's not just their worldly pursuits so of the things that they've done in the world. Look at Philippians 2 verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I sh- lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be less, be the less sorrowful. So he's praising Epaphroditus here. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all reputation. And this is what I want to point out here in verse 29. And hold such in reputation. So these are the sort of people we want to honor. The people that should receive honor in the church of God It's not just people that have accomplished great things for the world, right? It's when they've accomplished great things for God. They're doing great things for God. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such, who? People like Epaphroditus, 
in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. So these are the sort of people we should hold in reputation. So we're not just about holding up the truth, but we also want to tear down things that are false as well. 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to, pulling, to the pulling down of strongholds. So what is he saying here? Though we walk in the physical flesh, he's saying it's not a physical fight, it's a spiritual fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? They're not guns and knives and shields, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? So we know the Word of God is our offensive weapon casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So you see how this is a information war, right? Like the you know, Alex Jones channel, InfoWars. I think that's a, it's a cool brand, you know what I mean, InfoWars. But, you know, that's why. It's because this is what this fight we're in now. It's a spiritual war of words and of knowledge and of thoughts, imaginations, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, right? So a godly place, you want it to be a family, church should be a family, church should be a pillar of truth, and the last one is the church ought to be a ground of truth, a ground of truth, somewhere where people can get planted, they can get to know people here, somewhere they can fellowship, and just being here helps them to grow in their spiritual life. Right? A ground of truth. Look at what it says here in Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Right? They shall be fat and flourish. He said, if you plant yourself in, into the house of God, then you will start to grow. Now, how you plant yourself in is going to differ to how much you grow. But also, so I'm not really talking about, because today I'm talking about what the church should be, right, in terms of the ground. Now, you as the believer, how you plant yourself into the church will also change how you grow, right? Like if you plant yourself in and you get your roots deep, you know, like if you think of a plant, the deeper the roots go, the more solid they are in that ground, hey, the more nutrients they're going to pull from the ground, right? And the more stable they're going to be. So you think of yourself like a plant in the house of God. What do those roots represent in, in the real world? In the real world, it's the relationships and the, serve, the ministries you're in. The more you root yourself into this church, the more you know people, hey, the more you get to know me. Right? Like, hey, if somebody wanted to learn from the Bible, learn, hey, you reach out to me and say, hey, Victor, I'll spend some time with you, ask you some questions and whatnot. Hey, that's a way. You're like, this root's coming into me, right? You can go to this person and other people. The more you root. So you think about those roots getting that nutrition. That's how you start like learning more. You know, people's behaviors and characters, you know, their example starts like rubbing off on you. The more time you spend with them, the more time you spend with people here, and you'll be more stable. Oftentimes people quit a church because they don't know anybody. Or they quit a church and they don't have any friends. Sometimes, you know, we have to dig our roots into that person because if they are not digging our roots in, we have to be the ground trying to get them to dig their roots in because oftentimes if we can't get them to solidify the church, they'll leave eventually too. Right? And that will only just be a disadvantage to their spiritual life and they're not in a house of God somewhere. So you need to be planted in the house of God. But the idea for the church is to be that good ground for people to plant into. So let's look at the parable of the sower. I'm just going to look at the explanation. And the parable of the sower, the immediate application is salvation, right? And what your heart is, your heart can be different types of ground. But what I want to think about here is because the church should be a ground of truth, we're thinking, we want to sort of think of the church as like somebody who wants to plant into this ground, well, what sort of ground are we creating for them to plant into? Right? So obviously the first one, if somebody's not even implanted in the ground at all, they're not even in church, you know, we've got to try and get people into church. So we want to be a church that is welcoming. Right? When anyone heareth the word, the kingdom, 
and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth them away, that which was sown in their hearts. And we know the first example in the parable of the sower is the seed doesn't even get into the ground. So what can we do as a church to not be this ground? Well, we've got to try and get people into this church. People that haven't seen in church, they reach out, they haven't seen you for a while. They come in, you know, inviting new people in. So we want to be a church that's welcoming. And I think we do this very well, guys. You know, somebody new comes. You know, it's great to have Denise here with us today. So hopefully you make her all feel welcome. But, you know, that's, that's, I think that's something that our church is very good at. Somebody comes, hey, welcome. Start coming a few times. Hey, come over for dinner. I want to get to know you. That's great, right? So this is trying to get them out of church into church. That's the sort of ground we want to be. You know, we don't want to be a church that's like clicky. You know, some churches, new person comes in the door, like nobody wants to talk to them, just ignore them. I mean, what a terrible ground that is, you know, for, for a church to be. That, they don't want the ground, a good ground that somebody can plant into when they're rejecting, you know, the plants that are trying to plant into that ground. Number 20, he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receive it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So we know this situation is a somebody that's not very, can't plant into that ground, right? They don't have a very deep soil. So how do we be a church that is a good ground? We don't, we don't want to be a church of ignorant people. Right, a, a church where we don't know, you know, the answers to things. We don't know why we believe this thing. We don't know why these things happen. I mean, God forbid, you know, somebody, you know, comes to somebody in this church and they're like, I can't believe God allows things to happen, and then they agree with them, you know, because they don't know. Oh, yeah, God, just because God loves us, doesn't mean He doesn't allow us to go through suffering. You know, just things like that. So we need to be a church that can root deep. And help people understand things. And then that's another way when they plant into this ground, they will be nice and solid. So what's another way? He that received, oh, uh, verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. See, so the first one, we don't want to be an unwelcoming church. Second one, we can say, well, we want to be a church that knows what they're talking about, knows what they believe. You know, I don't, like, this is what I'm trying to stop as well. You know, people talking to each other and then people have different wrong ideas on salvation and whatnot. This is what we have to try and strive as a church to understand. Hey, this is salvation. It's how salvation works. So if everyone's talking to each other, they understand what the truth is. But verse 22 is this godly environment, right? Like we talked about at the beginning. A godly place. So we don't want to be a place, a ground that is very thorny, right? Care of this world, deceitfulness of Richard. It's going to choke people from growing. You know, you want, you want people to come here and get planted and they get more worldly, right? We want people to come here and get planted and then they start becoming more godly, right? They become unfruitful. So we want to be the good ground. He that receives seed into the good ground he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So your heart works the same way, right? In the parable of the soil, you're talking about your heart, but we want the church to be good ground as well. Now we think about how we can apply the parable of the sower to the church. We can think about, hey, what sort of church we want this to be. Now the last verse here is Hebrews 10. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Right? So this is one of the reasons why when people get planted in a church, they, you know, they're encouraged to grow because this is what as a church we should be striving to do. We should be striving to provoke one another unto love and good works. You know, like if you go to a church and you say, oh, that church, you know, always pressuring me into doing this. And he's talking, Victor's always talking about soul winning. And always trying to get me to do this. I mean, is that what you come to church for? You come to, then you come to church for the wrong reason. Because <laughs> you're meant to come to church to be, you know, either rebuked and exhorted and encouraged to do right. Right? And if you go, oh, yeah, go there. I don't want to go there because people are both. Hey, that's... That's a good thing about a church, right? A good thing about a church is they care about your spiritual life. They, they want you to, to be growing. And we're, we want to be, you know, it's not just one way. We want it to be both ways. And eventually, you want to grow to the point where you're provoking others 
unto love and to good works. So you consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we see here, we're commanded to not forsake the assembly of God. So, you know, going to church is a commandment. You know, you are commanded to be in church, right? So you have to be planted in this ground, first of all, to even start growing. So it's good. Can, how, how much can a plant grow and be strong when it's not planted into a garden? Yeah, you can grow. You know, yeah, my, my wife has like those plants on the kitchen sill. They're only going to grow so big if they're not in soil. But if you put them into the ground and their roots can grow, they can grow a lot bigger, start bearing fruit and all that sort of stuff. So because church is a commandment, you can't have the attitude of, ah, do the church thing. Church is a commandment. You need to prioritize it because God has commanded it. That's why you should make it a habit. You know, block it out of your schedule. Don't wake up Sunday morning and then think, oh, do I feel like going to church? You don't have it prioritized. You already know what you're doing Sunday morning. You're going to be at church. So now you've got to work around that schedule. Right? You've got to work around what God has commanded us to do. And a good ground like here ought to be provoking unto love and good works. I'll just finish on this passage in Acts 2. We see here in Acts 2 verse 42 onwards, we see here these elements of what a church should be. Right? And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So there's that godly place where they are continuing in what they have been commanded to do, right? what the apostles are teaching. In breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together. Right? The house of God. All that believed were together. They spent time with one another. Had all things common. A bit like a family, isn't it? Sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart, praising God, right, lifting up like a pillar of truth, having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So you see how there, they're the pillar of truth, and here they're the ground of truth. People are getting planted in to the church there. And you know, because they had all these elements, like we talked about today, maybe that's why they were able to turn the world upside down fill Jerusalem with their doctrine. So I want you to consider this this morning. I'll leave you with this thought. You are the church, right? So the church is what it is because you are what you currently are now. Don't think the church is something else. The church is you. You look around the room, that's who the church is. So are you doing your part to make this church what it should be? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for the reminder this morning. Thank you for all the exhortation you give us through your word. And help us, Lord, to uh, you know, strive, constantly strive to make this church a godly place, make it a family, and help it to be a pillar and ground of the truth. So, uh, Lord, you know, when we're, we're not arrived, none of us are perfect, but I pray, Lord, that you help us to provoke each other to love and good works so we're all moving in the right direction. And we thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.